from other places that aren't very nice. Those places are dangerous, they're dirty, they're corrupt, and they're poor. And that's the main reason those immigrants are trying to come here, and you would too if you live there. President Trump asked why America doesn't receive more immigrants from places you might want to visit on vacation. Why aren't we getting more people from Norway, he said, which by almost any measure, including the UN's measures, is the most developed and richest country in the world. Well, saying this, Trump used an expletive, and that's not surprising either, since he uses them all the time and was speaking privately. And yet, for some reason, virtually everyone in Washington, New York, and L.A. considered this a major, major event. Why is that? To find out, we're joined by Jose Pera. He was Latino Communications Director for Barack Obama's 2012 campaign. And he joins us in the studio. Jose, thanks for coming on. Thank you for the opportunity, Tom. So I think it's, t I mean, of course, you can have a debate over what countries we ought to admit immigrants from. And I think we're kind of having that debate. But what bothers me about the explosion this afternoon is the dishonesty in it. And I'll just give you one example. Joan Walsh over on CNN, an analyst over there, was asked just a minute ago, would you rather live in Haiti or Norway? And she said with a straight face, I can't say. Now, that's lying. If we've gotten to the point where we all have to pretend that every country is exactly as nice as every other country, then we're being dishonest. No, it's basically they're talking about, I think the outrage here is about the insult and the expletive that is attached to the people who come from these countries and who are making a life here in the United States, contributing fully to the U.S. right now. They were talking specifically about El Salvador and Haiti, two countries where TPS was recently revoked by the Trump administration. Right. And between these countries, we're talking about the people from those countries. They're contributing close to $170 billion in GDP no, look, but I'm not, a I mean, year, let, and they're be, making a full uh, contribution well, to the I mean, economy. Well, I mean, it's actually a pretty it's those, a complicated, it's a complicated picture, but and, I, I agree with you. If you're saying that a lot of people who come from those countries are good people, of course, I completely agree. But the idea that you're not allowed to say that they're pretty crummy countries, Haiti, for example, or El Salvador, I've been in both of them. That's why people are leaving them to come here. So I don't understand what the sin is. You're not allowed to point out that other countries aren't as good places to live as America? Like, what is the problem? There is definitely an, an issue here because basically what ha what's happening here is that the president is connecting and articulating the same vision that we saw in Charlottesville. When they're talking about we won't replace you, with the, the, with the chanters I mean, and the marchers he, he, were talking about trying to be this time, rational it's, 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 it's the same thing and, and it's, it's look, not the same, it's the same thing. look he and said, it's the same oh, slow down what happened if to what to happened to the whole any, masses okay. that on the statue of liberty that we're talking and, about try and track with me here okay the president from what we know and maybe he said other things we don't know about but what if we know he said these countries are crummy places okay they're holes or whatever used profanity but the people who left those countries, some of them rode trains all the way through Mexico or hid in a wheel well of a plane to leave, they would agree with that. So why the outrage? Uh, is it you have to lie and pretend, as Joan Walsh does, that, I don't know, I'd live in Norway or Haiti? Like, we've gotten to a place where nobody can be honest about anything. Do you see the point? Well, for, for, first of all, one of the things is that... Do, do we apply the same, uh, the same metric to uh, Eastern Europe? We're talking about countries that are not doing too well right now in crime measures and economic uh, measures I mean, and, and, and other issues. But we seem, we seem, we seem, we to Romania. Seem, but we seem to be applying this uh, this only to countries where there are brown people, no, such I as mean, Haiti you and know El Salvador. What? Let's be totally and real. And we're talking about Norway, like you said yesterday, which again ties back to this social reengineering that okay, that say, they're trying I, to. I, I don't want to get all fact based on you, but Norway is according to the United well, Nations. Important. Well, here here are some. The United Nations says that Norway is the most developed country in the world. Its sovereign wealth fund, I think, is the biggest in the world because of the oil discoveries offshore there. As you know, it's the richest place in the world, mm -hmm. okay? Haiti is the poorest place in the hemisphere and has been for a long time. People are actually staying in this country right now legally because Haiti is so bad, we don't think they should have to return. So if you say Norway is a better place to live and Haiti's kind of a hole, anyone who's been to those countries or has lived in them would agree. But we're jumping up and down, oh, you can't say that. Why can't you say that? Well, let me tell you something. Most people in Norway, according to most polls, do not want to live under Trump's America right now. That's fine. You're kind of so, missing the point, so, which is because it, the overwhelming... It's, it's a question about values. Okay. You know, you are attaching this label to people who come from predominantly brown countries. And that is a problem. I don't know why And that is how decisions insist... on TPS are right. being made. Oh, okay. no, you know, uh, when, when you okay. take away legal status because these people were here I, legally. Uh, okay, hold on. Can and I just ask you again? Let me try to ask you a reasonable from people question. people who are contributing oh, right. you know, to okay. this country, then, you know, are, are you using what, but, the but statute wait, or are you wait, using wait prejudice to make those decisions? Right. Prejudice, racism, white supremacy, fine. But let's get back to it. So you're Norway, saying, Haiti. I mean, one is the richest country in the world. The other is one of the poorest countries in the world. You think it's immoral to point that out. It's a statement of values. 
I'm asking you a very simple question. If Haiti isn't such a bad place, why don't we say to the people who are here temporarily in refuge from Haiti, go back, it's great. We don't say that because it's not great. Actually, it's everything the president said it was. It's not an attack on Haitians. It's an acknowledgement that their country is not as nice as other countries. And if you can't even say that out loud without being called a racist by people like you and the morons over on MSNBC, oh, you're then just you can't. Me a moron. I'm not you. calling you a moron. I'm saying anybody who says that's a racist statement should explain how it is. And you can't. You said it's like Charlottesville. How is it like Charlottesville? Look, talking we're about? talking about a predominantly white country. And we're talking about a predominantly African country or, or people of African descent. And the a president. So you're not allowed to say that because look, of he it? Just, How about just, crime measures, well, he just, income, uh, well, he corruption? Just, I mean, like, what are you talking about? The president about? just said a few weeks ago that everybody in Haiti has AIDS. And that's one of the reasons why he wanted to cancel TPS, even though these people are here and they've been vetted, well, you know, know, time I mean, and time I again. I mean, look. I, no, you, you do know. No. You know, so I'm when you're at, when the you're thing that we know that he When you're said attaching sure. all these labels to an entire population of people, that is problematic, especially uh -huh. coming from the I leader of the I don't actually, th look, I'm going to speak for myself here when I say, uh, again, I think there are plenty of great people from Haiti and a lot of people who leave do from Haiti do well. I've met a ton of Haitians. Okay. There are a lot in Miami. And a lot of them have done well. But the truth is that when people from poor countries, not a measure of their moral stature, but when you come from a poor country, you are likely more, much more likely to be poor when you're here. And there's a lot of poverty already here, in case you haven't driven across the country. And so there's a real question about how much more we want to import. I come from a working class family, by the way, so I do know. Then, then you can't look at me and say that's racist. So, for example, I have the numbers on where our immigrants come from. Last year, we had 23,000 immigrants from El Salvador. I'm sure all great people. We had 404 from Norway. So we overwhelmingly give advantage to very poor countries. And it's an honest question, not a racial one. What effect does that have on the poverty rate in this country? I can tell you that, well, this is a free market uh, network. And I would imagine that you follow the, the basic um, uh, laws of economics, when you have people creating demand and mm -hmm. when you have people paying into the tax system, like this 23,000 people from the, the 23,000 uh, number that you just mentioned. From El Salvador. From El Salvador, uh, or the 200,000 who have TPS and the um, status was just revoked by the administration last week, you are taking that contribution away from the economy. And these people are going to Walmart, they're buying gas, they're buying clothes, Let me ask you they're this, going then. to supermarkets, so let's take a look and at, they are stimulating local so and national if, economy. If, if, so you're speaking in generalizations. Let's And again, I actually admire... The president all also is speaking immigrant. in generalizations. Okay, here. here's some specifics. These are the rates of welfare use by country. These are families that are using at least one welfare program in the United States. From Central and South American immigrants, it's 73%. Can you tell me where that uh, from, comes from? This is from CIS, it? Center for Immigration Studies, the people who keep the numbers on this. And then from South Asia, a non-white region, it's 17%. Come, by saying, the way, it's, uh, CIS coming from the Tanto Network. Right? I'm not saying that people from South Asia are better than from Central America. I'm just saying there's an economic cost in, in bringing people over who are more likely to go on public services and who are poorer. That's not a racial attack. It's an economic observation in a country that has a ton of poor people already. And you have no answer for that other than, oh, it's Charlottesville. Well, you're talking about social reengineering, the whole worry here. And that's why they want to do all with family-based migration. Because family-based migration, it, it's what they consider is leading to the browning of America. And that's the whole issue here. No, that is your fever dream. I'm throwing some actual economic statistics at you that you can't answer. And you're getting back to the black, brown, white thing. And I'm asking I just you, gave you. I just gave if, you numbers on the GDP one, impact from people from El Salvador and from people from Haiti right this. now. If people from poor countries are much more likely to go on welfare and make less. Doesn't mean they're bad people, but it means the cost of having them here is higher than people from other regions. I've That's seen other, reality. I've, I've seen other studies that actually say that immigrants are no more likely to go on welfare than I would. American, I would be fascinated to see American, that study because that, it doesn't exist. The rate it of does exist. No, it doesn't. The rate it of does. American families on using at least one welfare program is 30 percent. Now, that's higher than immigrants from South Asia, for example. You're absolutely right. But the preponderance of our immigrants, <coughs> excuse me, aren't coming from South Asia. They're coming from Latin America. And those rates are really high. And I think we have a right to ask questions about that. But you say it's racist. I can tell you something. Uh, have you heard of the five-year bar? I, I, I don't know what the five-year well, five bar is. The five-year bar is a law that Congress passed that doesn't allow 
an immigrant once they regularize their status to access welfare. So I would like to know how is it that yeah. you're coming up with those numbers Does it when law them? right now prevents people from using welfare. Right, yeah. Unless you're of course considering factoring things such as uh, when you get a scholarship, when you get a scholarship or, or public education. You know, and public education is actually an investment into the country. Yeah. So if you're considering that, if that's what you're factoring so let, is let me just welfare, ask you a question. you know, that's let really me, problematic. Right, okay. So, um, about half of all immigrants. And you can look from, up the five year bar in the from, Library right. of Congress. But the the way. Way. let me just speak to the reality rather than the law. The reality the law is, is reality, by the, the way. Actually, the law is not reality. Yes, and if is. the law was reality, we wouldn't be having this debate. Yes, right I, I, I could tell you right now because okay. I know a lot of people the, the, who are not this. able, able to access this. Medicare about, because so of the five year bar. About half of all immigrants from El Salvador right now are living at or near the poverty line. Again, doesn't mean they're bad people, it's not an attack on them. But that's not true for, for immigrants from other regions of the world. Again, why is it immoral for Americans to make the calculation? What makes us more prosperous and what makes us less Most prosperous? Most of the people who are going to be living near the poverty line are because usually because they're undocumented and they are not able to participate so in, why the is it a in the, in the, in the, in the full-time in the full time economy. The people who have been regularized for through a program like TPS, uh, you know, there are studies by construction associations around the country how they have moved to um, to supervisory roles. They're well trained and they're producing jobs for other people. There are, and they are generating and contributing. There are plenty contribu of immigrants who are well educated right now, and right now, well DACA, trained. DACA, right now, DACA students are contributing 280 billion to the to you the know, GDP of the country. You don't actually know a lot about these numbers, and you're just oh yes, I do. Some talk show. Oh yes, I. Do. But let me ask you. Let me just ask you a theoretical question then, so we don't. You get know where into that, a you know, you know where it comes from? Of, of fake numbers. Okay. Cato Institute. Cato Institute. Cato Institute. And for magazine, which I'm sure you consider that a leftist publication. Right. Do, okay, let's get to a philosophical question. Do you think it's fair for American citizens who live here to decide who comes on the basis of who will potentially help our country more? In 1965, we changed the laws in this country to be closer to family-based migration because this Please we were using we were using quotas for we were using quotas that well we're using 80, quotas now. Eight, eight, eight to one. Want dreamers to stay in the country. Okay, so if you, you if you if you're asking no, about no, 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 no. if you're asking, asking about you. how many Americans are looking for most support I'm DACA you a and to regularize okay. the status of dreamers. If you can't answer a question. It is kind of productive Who just to filibuster. We? Is it? Do you think at least theoretically allowed for Americans to say, "Hold on, let me finish." Uh huh. Let's figure out who's most likely to add to our economy. Who's most likely to assimilate? Do you think it's okay, or is that racist, like everything else that I brought up? Is that okay to ask that question, or is it immigrants? Racist? Immigrants do do assimilate. As a matter of but fact, is it I can tell you, fair for Americans I went, to ask that question? What's good for us? Are we allowed to ask that question, who is or is we? that racist? Who is we when you say Americans? Because right now, I don't know. 86, 86, well, I don't know. You, you have to tell me who you define as Americans. Who are asking How about that the majority of the saying, electorate? Well, I can tell you that but eighty-six. The, the, the latest president. poll that came out today says that eight. 80% of Americans want dreamers to assimilate, okay. including two-thirds okay. of Republicans. But, so, I'm sorry, so we're arguing so, apples and oranges. No, I'm we're not. You we're, a arguing about, we're arguing also, about immigrants. So that does, a, does a country have a right to decide who comes in and who doesn't come in. Most Americans want immigration reform in 2013 by every question. poll, by because every you, poll, because you can't. by every right. poll, this and is, you guys tanked it in the House of Representatives. You so it's not like you guys want to fix the system. I think our viewers can determine where you're coming from. Jose, thank you. Thank you for your time. Mark Stein is an author, a columnist, and by the way, an immigrant. We'll let him decide whether his homeland was any sort of hole. He joins us tonight. Um, so, Mark, I mean, maybe I'm, you know, misreading this. Um, and maybe there are things the president said that I didn't hear. I'm mean, sure there were. But from what I could hear, he was saying, look, why would we give, well, apparently, preference to poor countries over rich ones? And that doesn't seem like a crazy thing to say. Well, I, I think he's actually saying, why should we give preference to dysfunctional societies over over others? And, and I, I'll say it if Jose won't. Uh, until 50 years ago, every nation on earth, every Western nation particularly, thought it had the right to discriminate when it came to immigration among those countries uh, and those people who would find it easier to assimilate and contribute to the country they were moving to. And if Jose thinks uh, you don't like black people or brown people, let's keep it all black. Uh, I think it's 
uh, I, I don't think... Uh, I, I agree with the president. I wish he'd f formulated it more elegantly, but Haiti is a bleep hole, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Barbados isn't. St. Kitts isn't. Grenada isn't. St. Lucia isn't. Uh, there are distinctions one can make, even within quite small groups of countries. Uh, and as to uh, Joan Walsh uh, refusing to say whether she'd rather move to Haiti or Norway, let's not wait for Joan. Let's wait for the... Let's just look at the existing traffic. There are uh, immigrants all over the world who move to Norway. Nobody voluntarily moves to Haiti. Why is that? Because it's a dysfunctional society, and so are many of the others uh, from which uh, uh, America's present ludicrous immigration system uh, takes newcomers from. So here's my, my question. So China is the most aggressive colonial power in the world right now, and it's investing mm. all over Africa and all over Latin America right. and all over the Caribbean, right. spending $30 billion right. in Haiti, for example. There's no yeah. pressure from Joan Walsh or the American left for the Chinese to absorb immigration from any of those regions at all. They're not denounced as racist for keeping their borders totally closed to everybody. Why is that, I wonder? Well, because uh, China is allowed uh, to advance its own interests. So it's bought, for example, a big ton of bauxites uh, in Jamaica, the bauxite industry in Jamaica. Yes. But it doesn't feel that along with that, it has to import a big bunch of Jamaicans to its country. And that is, that is when, when people like, people can object to what uh, President Trump says, but it actually makes far more sense than if you look at what Pat Leahy said, who just, sa uh, who just sent out this uh, eunuch tweet in response, Leading, that's not who we are. It's not enough, actually, just to say, that's not who we are. And in fact, that's the response to every one of these uh, so-called problems. That's not who we are. Well, they never actually say who we are. Uh, they just say, that's not who we are. And who we are seems to be devolving down into the people who say, that's not who we are. Everybody else, China, Haiti, Norway, is allowed to be who we are and act as a nation in its own national interests, including on immigration policy. Yeah. Well, I think China could use a little more diversity. So we'll, we, we'll be pushing for that in future weeks. Thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, I appreciate exactly. it. Exactly. Thanks, Tucker. Senator Lindsey Graham had some uncharitable words for this show and anyone who believes in real borders. Of course, he refused to join us, but we'll respond anyway next. Well, a couple of nights ago, the show was critical of President Trump's public immigration summit with congressional leaders, where the president indicated he was willing to step back from DACA negotiations personally and sign whatever deal that lawmakers agreed on. Senator Lindsey Graham was pleased with it, though. Watch. I think the president did a fabulous job of talking about this problem. He did it uh, in a smart way, in a compassionate way. And, uh, you know, uh, his job is not to, to sell books. His job is not to carry a TV show. His job is to solve problems, and he's got to work with Democrats. And I was proud of my president yesterday. Selling books. Uh huh. As if we could ever rival Senator Lindsey Graham for cynicism. We never could. And for the record, we never say anything on this program we don't sincerely believe. Can Lindsey Graham say the same? Chris Kobach is Secretary of State for Kansas, and he joins us tonight. Uh, Mr. Kobach, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So um, I'm concerned because what we thought was never going to happen again appears to be happening, and that's the leadership of the Republican Party basically ignoring what its own voters want in favor of a deal that, again, fails to seal the border and give us actual security and the right to choose who comes here. Am I imagining that? No, you're, you're not imagining it. And uh, the, the worst, the most troubling thing about that meeting on Tuesday that, that I saw was you had multiple Republicans repeating the mantra, we've got, to do am we've got to do DACA, we've got to do DACA, we've got to give an amnesty for these people. Look, Tucker, you know that, and you po you've pointed this out, the, the DACA amnesty is bad for Americans. It's granting an amnesty to nearly a million people in their 20s and 30s, their average age is 24, who are going to compete against young Americans who have a 9% unemployment rate in that age group. And for the young Americans who don't have a college degree, it's a whopping 34% underemployment rate. So we're legalizing foreign nationals who have broken our laws to compete against Americans who can't get a job. So that's bad policy. In addition, it's going to cause another surge in illegal immigration. So 
the idea that we have to do this is ludicrous, and, and we should only even consider doing this unless, if there are many, many law enforcement advantages that are given to it, like ending chain migration. Uh, I think we have to have mandatory E-Verify. And if we don't get everything we want to, to secure our borders, including the wall, then we walk away from the deal. We don't need to do DACA. And not only do it, but put it right to the very top of the list of priorities of the U.S. Congress. Before everything, before the opioid crisis that's literally short, shortening the life expectancy of middle America, we need to do this. I feel sorry for some of the DACA recipients, for sure. I'm not attacking them. But it's not clear why, if you have any questions about it, you far better people than we are because they're for amnesty. How'd that happen exactly? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, uh, furthermore, as you probably, as I'm sure, sure you know, uh, Tucker, Lindsey Graham and this uh, group of uh, six senators that came up with an even more generous mega amnesty, much bigger than DACA, that they have now announced that they favor. Um, the point is, he seems to be giving away the store. He doesn't seem to care that much about all the damage that an amnesty does to hardworking Americans. And so you're absolutely right. And, and one other thing, the false urgency about all this is, is ludicrous, yes. too. You know, there's the March 5th deadline that President Trump set. But all that happens on March 5th is that some of the DACA work permits start to expire. A day right. after day, some more expire. There's nobody showing up at their at their home uh, with a, a, a armed ICE agents with a vehicle to escort them out of the country that day. So the notion that we have to rush to grant a bad amnesty is simply false. Yeah, it is false. I'm amazed that Senator Graham has taken time out from advocating for war with Iran to to take this position, but he has. Uh, and I was, I was grateful yeah. to have you uh, put it in context. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you. Take care. A Vermont newspaper editor has lost his job for raising questions about gender politics. That editor joins us next. I'm it's increasingly clear that corporate America is now the left's ideological enforcer. It couldn't be clearer, and it's not just happening in Silicon Valley. Until this week, Dennis Finley was an editor at the Burlington Free Press in Vermont, but the Gannett media giant unceremoniously fired him this Tuesday after he tweeted questions about a Vermont proposal to create a third gender option for driver's licenses. Why'd they do that? Well, Dennis Finley joins us tonight to answer that question. Dennis, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Tucker. Thanks for having me. So the, the reason I want to talk to you is I was sincerely, and I'm not just saying this rhetorically, a little bit confused by your firing since you didn't attack transgendered people. You didn't even attack the idea of a third sex on the driver's licenses from the tweets that I saw. But you asked questions to somebody else on Twitter. I didn't understand how that was out of bounds. Well, I believe Tucker was out of bounds because I didn't agree with it. Uh, I think it's as simple as that. There's a very... There's a powerful uh, contingent of speech police out there. Uh, this is an extremely liberal state, progressive state. And uh, I kind of galvanized them uh, unwittingly. And it went on and on all through the weekend. And they didn't want to stop until they had my head on a platter. And they finally got it on Monday evening. But you say Vermont is liberal, but there's nothing liberal about taking a man's livelihood away because you disagree with him. That's not liberal. That's something else. Well, uh, you'd have to ask them, but I think they think it's a feather in their cap anytime they can get rid of somebody who disagrees with them. I think that's what's going on here. But you're a journalist and have been for a long time and isn't a kind of key tenet of journalism that you get to say what you think is true. The truth is a defense. Truth is a defense. You get to say what is true, but uh, in uh, the, the age we live in, our companies, a lot of media companies say that we're supposed to be objective, impartial, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I want to ask questions. I want to raise questions and raise issues because I think there are a lot of things going on that we have to ask questions about. And putting a third gender on a, a driver's license is something that I thought we should ask a question about. So someone on Twitter said something to the effect, I think this is great or courageous. And you said, why is it great and courageous? Courageous. Great. Uh, correct. And I really, I, I believe that if I had said, that is great and courageous. Awesome. That's great. I don't think we'd be having this conversation here today, Tucker. So the question really isn't about objectivity. They're not asking you to be objective. They're asking you to toe a very specific line. 
of course. They're asking me to toe the line. They're asking me to agree with them. And they're asking me to, uh, they're holding my feet to the fire uh, to, uh, m you know, make sure that the orthodoxy wins out. And this time, uh, you know, they held my feet to the fire until my company said, that that's enough, you're fired. Do, have, do you see this as a trend? It's something that I've begun to notice where big companies have become the heavies for the cultural left. You think of big companies as conservative, but all of a sudden they, they're the ones who seem to be enforcing orthodoxy. Is, is that my imagination? No, I don't think it is. I think big companies, uh, a lot of big media companies are more or less uh, encouraging the left. I believe that they, uh, I don't think that they're objective. I don't believe that they want debate. Uh, I think they want us to, to uh, conform and conform to the prevailing uh, ideology that's out there. And the prevailing ideology that's out there is leftists. And yeah. when the leftists uh, take you on, uh, they're big in number and people are afraid to say anything against them. So uh, they, they often win. They, they won a little while ago here in Vermont when they shouted Charles Murray off the stage yeah. in Middlebury when he tried to give a speech. Uh, that was on your show. Uh, I know. So yeah, it's hard to disagree with them. Well, uh, or they it's, take your fact, job you away. Can't. And here we are in the middle of the winter, and you're in Vermont, and you got no job. So our, our prayers are with you, Dennis. Good luck. Right. I hope you find right. something. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Have you heard? UFOs may actually be real, for real. And the Pentagon spent millions of dollars investigating them. We're not insane. These are facts. We're going to talk to an actual journalist who's been working on that for a while and who exposed that secret program in the New York Times. Stay tuned. Well, you may not have heard about this, since apparently it's not a big news story somehow, but UFOs turn out to be real. We're not kidding. Recently, the New York Times profiled a secret $22 million Pentagon program that investigated unidentified flying objects. Doesn't mean they're from outer space, but they're not identified, and they're flying, and they're objects. The program wasn't bogus. Investigators found multiple aircraft encounters they could not explain, and they've even been storing metal alloy recovered from the vicinity of these encounters. Leslie Kane wrote about this in the New York Times, that piece in question, and she also wrote a book called UFO Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. She spent years investigating UFOs with the support of former Bill Clinton Chief of Staff, by the way, John Podesta. Leslie Kane joins us tonight. Leslie, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tucker. So that piece, I think, vindicated uh, a lot of work that you've been doing for an awfully long time and certainly got my attention, and I've stopped making fun of people like you and started started paying attention. This seems like a huge story. So I, I know that it's it's vast and hard to sum up, but if you could just briskly tell us what we think we know about these sightings. Well, we do know that there are objects in the sky and sometimes in the water that demonstrate extraordinary capabilities that we, but that experts say we don't have on this planet. We don't have the capability of, of creating the kind of technology that or apparent technology that's been observed by high-level officials for many, many decades. The Pentagon program is the most recent discovery, but these things have been studied in other countries and by our country for many years. So what percentage of these sightings are we sure are not weather phenomena or experimental aircraft? Well, that's a really good question, because most sightings of UFOs that, that just people report are not, are, are identifiable. I mean, we're talking yes. about a very, maybe five to 10% of all the sightings that are called in are are not explainable. And what the ones that are really of interest are the ones reported by military pilots, by commercial pilots, by trained observers, multiple witnesses, ones that are caught on radar, events that have a lot of data to support them and involve very, very credible people. So I, I guess what bothers me most about this story is how clearly people who should have been following up and paying attention haven't been. And the, the case that sticks with me, November 7th, I think, 2006, at Chicago Air, Air, Ho, Hare Airport, 4.15 in the afternoon, gate C-25, I believe, the pilot of the plane waiting to depart to Charlotte looks up and there is a saucer hovering not that far over the plane. People in the tower see it, other pilots see it, dozens of people see it. It's real, and the FAA refuses to investigate. How could that be? I know. It's shocking. It's absolutely shocking to me. I mean, they, they refuse to investigate, I think, because they 
I mean, who knows what the bigger, the bigger reason probably is that it's very, they can't explain these things and they just want, you know, they don't want to deal with them. It might frighten people. They don't have enough information. They don't like to say, well, there's something hovering above an airport, but we don't know what it was. So basically they will come up with other explanations for it, such as that it was a weather phenomenon. That's what the FAA said about O'Hare, which is really an insult to the pilots who witnessed this thing and many other observers who know that it wasn't weather. I mean, it was a metallic looking disc shaped object that hovered over the, as you said, hovered over a terminal at gate C-17 for about five minutes. And then it shot straight up through the clouds. This was an incredible aspect of the thing. It was hovering below a cloud bank. And all of a sudden it just shot straight up really fast through the cloud bank and cut a hole in it. So there was like a cookie cutter clean hole in the clouds. You could look up and see the blue on the other side. And you know, as far as anybody knows, as far as I know, and from what I've been told, we don't have uh, machines in the sky that can do things like but, that. But I mean, this is not a potato field in Maine in the 1950s at three in the morning. This is Chicago right. O'Hare, one of the biggest, busiest airports in the world in the middle of the day in front of sober witnesses, including pilots and the control tower. And the FAA says, we're not that interested. Like, how could that be? Yeah, I know. I mean, I, it's, it's very bad. I appreciate how baffled you are, Tucker, because I'm I baffled am. too. And you can imagine that the uh, witnesses involved with this, you know, it's an insult to them. I mean, there are many witnesses, and we're talking about military people, you know, high-level people in the Air Force, the Navy, the uh, other military commercial pilots who are just told that they're, we're not interested in what they saw. And it's very